Greetings. In this video, I am joined by Magonian of the Magonian Research Group. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Tom, aka Magonian, and uh, the co-host of Radio Free Magonia and the co-founder of the Magonia Research Group. Yeah, I run kind of several on and off blogs, most recently Ghosts of Magonia, which is easily findable online. The Magonia Research Group is mostly done through Discord, right? Mm -hmm. Communication through the chat platform and audio platform Discord? Yeah, it has been so since HL and I started it in mid-February of 2019. The group's been quite a considerable success story. It's still a kind of small and homely, I like to think, place. Um, but we have had quite a, quite a star-studded cast. People like Albert Rosales, author of the Humanoid Encounters series of books, which you'll probably know, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl Grove, who's a time slip researcher from Britain. So uh, we've had people sharing their thoughts and research um, on the Discord server. Since uh, February of 2019, we've expanded greatly and established a presence on several other social media sites, as well as in the real world through some very small scale boots on the ground investigations. We started our own podcast in late 2020, though I haven't personally been able to participate much in that because of the time zone differences. And so speaking of uh, time zones, where are you from? Ah, yes, I'm from Britain, Kent, England, and um, you can probably hear it in my voice. It is quite late in the evening for me, and um, so I am running on tea and spite. <laughs> I'm, of course, in West Virginia, so it's like 5.30 right now. More daytime, evening time for me. Yep. So and, um, you're the, the co-founder of the Magonia Research Group. You started it with uh, someone who goes by the username Humanoid Lord. Could you talk about that? Yeah, the answer to that is a complicated one. He's an international man of mystery. I know literally nothing about his identity beyond a screen name. He and I, he and I, we met online through a UFO forum, basically. We both kind of realized that we had an interest in the non-nuts and bolts side of ufology, the folklore behind it, and specifically the ideas of John Keel. So from there, we moved over onto Discord and started our own group. Yeah, I refer to him as HL, just because that seems less kind of clunky mm -hmm. than Humanoid Lord, <laughs> and also seems, you know, when I'm, when I'm on podcasts, seems more respectable. So um, uh, you said you were very inspired by John Keel, but you also have to be very inspired by Jacques Vallée to name a group Magonian. Absolutely. Yeah. So John Keel, Jacques Vallée, and more modern researchers like uh, Joshua Kutchin are very much our inspirations. Mm -hmm. Fellow Fordians in the audience will be aware that Jacques Vallée is the author of Passport to Magonia, which is a, a classic UFO fairy lore book from 1969. Quick thing for the audience about Magonia. The name comes from a uh, mysterious realm in the skies, according to French folklore of the 9th century. So it was a world from which felonious sky sailors would hail, coming down to Earth to steal our crops and livestock so they could offer them as tributes to kind of nebulous sky wizard type characters. So uh, Vallée pointed out that uh, this was very similar, albeit kind of interpreted through a kind of more mystical as opposed to technological lens, very similar to our modern UFO law, with the theft of livestock and crops, as well as obviously people coming down from the skies at night. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, I guess you could say, similar to the cattle mutilations and disappearances of animals and all that from the, the UFO field. Yep, exactly. And um, yeah, so that, that book was really, a, when I first read it, it was an absolute mind opener for me. I read it and never once looked back. It's kind of like uh, sort of a comparative mythology comparison between the UFO field and fairy lore. And uh, I'm sure it was very uh, subversive oh, uh, yeah. for Jacques Vallée, who's like an actual scientist, to be diving into fairy lore. And he was Absolutely. into it around the same time John Keel was uh, writing his books that later came out in the 70s. You know, John Keel had yeah. a lot of uh, ideas very similar with um, not just fairy lore, but mythology of all kind, comparing them to the UFOs and the Ufonauts. And a lot of that study came about when he was you know, in Point Pleasant in 66 and 67. You know, they shared a lot of, um, a lot, a lot a of ideas. Ground. Yeah. Yeah. What did you want to talk about today? Well, mostly I wanted to talk about uh, the group and how it came about and what the, the mission statement or the, the goal is of the group and kind of talk about the group uh, on my channel because I haven't really had much opportunity to talk about it other than my recent interview with AP Strange, who I yeah, met in the group. Okay. The Magonia Research Group is currently pretty small, and it has been steadily growing since its birth in 2019. It is showing no signs of stopping. Let's just say I didn't expect I didn't expect us to be so successful, to be entirely honest. I have been extremely pleasantly surprised by how well we've been received by the 14 community in general. 
Yeah. So I was invited in early 2020 by Humanoid Lord through uh, Twitter DMs. Um, I guess he saw my tweets and saw my my interest in John Keel and Jacques Vallée and all that. He invited me there and gave me uh, the passport to Magonia, if you will. Yep, indeed. We do scope people out regularly on Twitter to look for um, look for new members and potential new angles to take. I think that one of the things which we are in dire need of right now, actually, is kind of new blood and new members, people who are available to bring new ideas and new ways of looking at things and planning something of a revamp in the very near future. And this is definitely going to hopefully work to bring that to the group. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, one of the things I, I like about the group is the international perspective, because there are people there from all over the world. And I also like the affinity they have for the classics. Like you'll see a lot of interesting drawings from classic cases, people discussing classic cases and things like that. And so that's kind of what uh, draws me to the group to you know participate in it because of that sort of retro stuff. Definitely. Yeah, because I, I will also definitely admit that I have a big affinity for the retro stuff and for the 60s and 70s era of ufology. And so I collect I collect books on this topic, and some of my favorites to get my hands on are these really old kind of yellowed paperbacks. I love all these like old, odd like Peter Colosimo. I have Timothy Good over there on my shelves, and uh, Jenny Randall's, obviously John Keel, Jacques Vallée. I think that the older era, it definitely has, a, has an atmosphere which has been lost today. Recently, Researching our history as a field and looking into theories which have been proposed in the past and ideas which have been proposed in the past. For me, especially, not just the 1960s and not just the kind of golden age of ufology, but also way back in the past, like ancient history. And not not ancient aliens type things, but more, to, to tie it back to ballet, more like ideas about elementals and spirits like that and how that concept can tie into modern day ufology is particularly fascinating to me Mm -hmm. so i wanted to know if there was any group in particular because there there's been a a long history of ufo clubs and saucer clubs and groups like this was there any group in particular that inspired you or was it just hey we should get a bunch of people together that is a really good question i think that um some of the members of our group would like to would like to say that it's oh like Valet's invisible college and all of this, while others would like to say that we're like the extremely low budget version of the TGSA. But honestly, I think that for me personally, it was definitely to be entirely honest, it was more of a we should get some people together and kind of create this even just like a, a small club to share information, almost like a kind of Discord based kind of UFO mailing list. Mm-hmm. There was actually a Magonia mailing list a while back in the late 90s and early 2000s a lot of bizarre cases which were shared on there and i really think that that sort of thing doesn't really happen nowadays i'm probably sounding like kind of moaning about kids these days and all of that but like it feels like nowadays if somebody has a strange story they go to twitter or reddit and that's where the story goes to die basically Mm -hmm. and i think that that definitely shouldn't be the case that feels like the mission statement the mrg almost to document these stories to document these stories and hopefully research enough to get to a point where we we can form our own theories about what is going on. And, and I, I have seen some, you know, people in the group coming up with ideas and there, there's a few like labels and words that use like pretty much exclusively in the group. Uh, I think Phantom Strangers is one that specifically yes. people talk about there and you have uh, interesting ideas about uh, space slugs and things like that. So there's, <laughs> there's a bunch All of, um, of there's a bunch of kind of inside jokes or inside theories that uh, the group has that's pretty cool. So I, I have seen creative yeah. ideas in the group. It's not all just uh, the classics. There are some, you know, new ideas floating around and some ideas to get in on. Totally. Okay. In that case, let's talk about space slugs. Yep. Good segue. Um, Yep. Let's talk about space slugs. So I'm going to see if I can try and find them. You've caught me off guard and I do not have that with me right now on the notes that I've taken. While you're looking for that, I should just say back in the day, there was a lot of saucer clubs like uh, APRO and NICAB, things like that, where people would physically meet together and talk about UFOs and you know, they have newsletters and all that sort of thing. Newsletters and fanzines are kind of how the, the UFO community survived back in the day. And then in the early 2000s and stuff, it was more group chat, like chat rooms, like early forums and stuff eventually. But the whole Discord thing, 
that seems to be a, a step forward because uh, I had never heard of, of Discord being used for anything other than like video games. So when Humanoid Lloyd reached out to me, I had to say like, okay, should, should we use this platform for talking about 40 and Matters? And then I thought, well, it seems like a pretty good platform. It, you know, why not? It's a good platform for making groups and doing that sort of uh, direct instant message communication. And um, also through Google Docs, you can share more in-depth content. So it seems like a good method yep. of doing a Flying Saucer Club or a Fordian research society in modern day digitally internationally so i think it's a, a good step forward yeah it's a strange it's a strange thing because discord really is associated primarily with gaming i know that hl does have at least a passing interest in video games i assume that's why he suggested it but it honestly works really well you can like properly divide up the chat into different channels and so then have different different subjects for different channels so you can like properly organize all the information that you're sharing and i think it works way better than just a, like a single yep. like a single channel mailing list Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good. It allows the chat to be properly streamlined and everything. Yeah, de definitely right. a step up from the the old days of email lists and things like that. More of a instant communication. And it's, uh, like I said, there's a lot of people there from all over the world. So it's an instant international communication. And that's something that uh, the classic researchers of the 50s, 60s, 70s, something they would have dreamed about right there. Absolutely. Um, I remember reading about Al Bender, his uh, International Flying Saucer Bureau. Uh, it was called International because he had like like one or two members outside of America. And so that itself constituted it being international. So this is definitely a, the modern thing is much more instant communication, you know, over the world. Yeah. Yeah, we're able to stretch our wings way further now, which is amazing. It's really good to be able to properly make use of modern technology to, to share these stories. So I was listening to your earlier interview with Willow the Witch when you were talking about documenting folklore. That's where I started my journey as well. I started with folklore and I started with mythology. Then in 2017, I think it was, in 2017, I realized that my own UFO experience had been legitimate and had been something which seemingly actually happened to whatever degree these events actually happened. That combined with reading Jacques Vallée for the first time and seeing the seeing the kind of like not just kind of like Zachariah Sitchin that kind of like ultra materialistic intermeshing of religion and folklore and UFOs but seeing a much more syncretic and much more functional version of that belief system actually being something that exists it was really enlightening for me so it was really a kind of wow how could I have possibly missed all this moment for me and so that's when I moved from just gathering folklore and just gathering stories about monsters basically to actually researching potentially phenomena that take place so did you begin uh, collecting folklore because of your experience or just because you like folklore honestly here's something which um here's something which i don't think which i don't think many people can say but uh when i was five years old i wanted to be a cryptozoologist so i have i have loved this stuff for my entire life one of my earliest memories of being on holiday with my family i remember i had so there was this there was this old website in like the early 2000s it was called unknowncreatures.com and i remember they had these amazing pencil drawings of cryptids and i remember that i'd printed out like a big boulder of them almost and i remember like talking to my dad about the um, maryland goat man and the jersey devil i have always really loved this stuff i don't quite know why when i had that experience it was it was strange for a young child to be looking at this light in the sky and thinking that's a ufo because like obviously most child witnesses wouldn't really be able to contextualize what they were seeing until later whereas i was i was looking at that and thinking that's a ufo and then only later did i get older and kind of ra i kind of rationalized it away so i rationalized it away as probably having been a hallucinatory experience or something and then only in 2017 did i did i finally realize that i should probably ask around my family as to whether or not they'd had any experiences and that was when my dad told me that uh, he had been looking after my then baby brother at the time and had seen the same thing that i had seen the second floor window but uh, I, I now have the notes about the space slugs right here in front of me. So now I want to quickly say this is not what I believe now. This was a, a kind of a kind of spitball, basically. Yeah, cause, like the, the idea of like a hypothetical theory is something that goes way back. Like Charles Fort, he wrote a bunch of theories that he didn't really believe in those. He was just kind of throwing them out there as like an idea that, you know, could be so or that he felt was just as plausible as what the, the scientific minds of the time were saying. And in fact, some yeah. of them were specifically to criticize you know like okay this is how you sound or this is just as likely as what you're proposing so just so we're clear there's a lot of hypothetical thinking goes into these uh researching these topics so yeah go ahead 
yeah, definitely. Okay, so basically, the um the first the first kind of seeds of the what I refer to as the uh, psychic space slugs theory is um we started to consider that perhaps there was a biological route to the UFO phenomenon in general, and we were throwing around ideas about pterosaurs and fungi. Even then, eventually, we came to the kind of Trevor Constable esque theory of amoeba like life forms living in the upper atmosphere. So I'm sure you've heard of like the kind of sky beasts, sky critters, mm-hmm. the flying manta rays, and and uh, jellyfish come to mind. Yeah, all of that basically. So we were suggesting that perhaps. So if if we if we presuppose that psychic capabilities are a reality, which obviously is questionable, but if we presuppose that, and if we say that humans have that, but why not other intelligent life? Like why couldn't other intelligent life also have that? So again, uh, on one of the previous episodes of this po- of your podcast, you mentioned tulpas and thought forms, egregores. Mm-hmm. So we were suggesting that perhaps the UFOs and the flying saucers and the flying objects which have been detected on radar and seem to physically exist, what if they are the only part of the UFO phenomenon that is physically real and everything else is a thought form tulpa, it's a kind of induced hallucination almost. And so what if we have a, um, a species which is more intelligent than humans um, deliberately playing our culture and creating our boogeyman to hide behind? Okay, so let's say that we're technologically superior, of course, and thus completely capable of eradicating them if we wanted to, but they are capable of creating these solid thought forms and, like, kind of psychedelic-style hallucinations in those who aim to attack them, thus rendering our attacks completely ineffectual. And so, yeah, this is not what I actually think, but I think that a psychedelic, psychic space slug is a pretty funny idea and pretty pretty interesting as, as a kind of thought experiment, almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's and... also the the salt thing where some beings are afraid of salt, so <laughs> lines yes. up. Yep, it does. And um, there's a painting, painting of Jesus being baptized. I think it is. Yeah, the baptism of Christ by Art de Gelder, I think. And um, probably butchering that pronunciation. But um, yeah, it shows a disc-shaped object in the sky above Christ with these kind of with these four beams of light coming down onto him. We were talking about the uh, the kind of that image of enlightenment in old religious art as well and there's this um, there's another another painting of the crucifixion which seems to show two very jellyfish looking objects behind jesus and you have this very creepy kind of like undercurrent existing in all throughout religious art and all throughout culture of belief in a powerful supernatural other of you have images of both things that vaguely resemble jellyfish but primarily things that resemble mushrooms and obviously you could you could draw a link between psychedelia and that or you could go the whole nine yards and say that you're dealing with some kind of a psychic fungus or psychic organism and obviously i think that's a little bit nuts <laughs> but to be honest this entire field is based on speculation and is based on throwing out ideas that seem to fit extremely bizarre data yeah i think a lot of theories are pretty much uh, trying to reconcile the data that they get in john keel said at one point in order for you to understand what i'm trying to say i have to bury you in the data. Uh, Also quoting Sherlock Holmes, uh, data, 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 I can't make bricks without clay. So once you understand the data, only then do you understand like, okay, why are they saying this? Like what's with this narrative and what's with this idea? It's because it fits with what people are saying, you know, people who are, you know, not even linked together, witnesses from different places, different times and seeing similar things. And so these are kinds of ways of reconciling that. I think two things you're hitting on with that theory is one is the seeming contradiction between material and immaterial of the entities that people claim to encounter, where they are like almost metaphysical. In some cases, they leave footprints, but in some cases, your hand yeah. passes right through them. So you're trying to say like, okay, maybe there's a, an organic component to it, which is part of that theory. And yes. uh, the other thing would be the idea of how these clearly play into human narratives and theologies and folklores like like uh, what John Keel was talking about with the Operation Trojan Horse, uh, the idea that they might be hiding behind myth. Um, I think Keel was more saying that they were using myth as a way to influence mankind uh, more than just hiding behind it. Because I think if you look at some of these stories, the, the being is coming out to specifically encounter the person to get their attention. So it's not as much hiding behind the myth, I would say. I think it's more using the myth to influence or to put uh, an idea into their mind. That's a, another way okay. to look at that. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. 
if they wanted to be hidden, they could just like stay hidden and never appear. It looks like these these beings are purposefully coming out to humans and showing themselves so that they will write about them or base folklores or theologies based on those mystical experiences. Totally, yeah. The, uh, the space slugs theory is extremely flawed. I think that any, pretty much all theories that have been proposed, proposed either seriously or semi-seriously, as the space slugs are, any theories that have been proposed at all are very flawed. I think it was Joshua Kutchin who said this, but any everything you can say about the phenomenon, you can also say the exact opposite and have it be true as well. It, it is kind of a contradicting thing. But I was going to say that um, if you want to go with that, the whole idea of it being camouflage, that would mean that the cultural effects, like the narratives and the folklores and the theologies that spring about, would be like accidental, like unintended side effects. So that would be a, a different way of viewing that. But I guess it could be like that. It, would, it seems that it's more intentional. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that it is more intentional the space slugs were an idea in like late 2019 which i think we all kind of briefly entertained because it was fun <laughs> yeah basically. from from the name you can tell that it's not that serious it's more of a, a funny yeah. thing to, to bring up but yeah so there, there's an idea straight from the begonia research group that's something you probably won't find uh, exactly in any book yep. so there you go and so we're doing think, new stuff too uh, oh yeah oh yeah we're doing new stuff but another thing another thing which you mentioned are the phantom strangers more something which i've named and i think the name works pretty well um but these are the to use Kiel's examples, these are the men in black, the kind of pseudo, the kind of things pretending to be people. So these are the spooky characters who show up in a lot of these narratives who look just like humans normally, but who really don't act like humans, who appear and ask to be let into your house, for example, and seem to be unable to come into the house unless you invite them in. Talking about like the, the men in black and the relatively modern conception of the black-eyed children. These creatures which appear to be a non-human predator, almost, or, or at least like non-human kind of functionary thing performing a role in a human skin, so to speak, which is a very unsettling idea. And I think it really does play into the uncanny. And it really does play into the kind of the paranoia that is deeply entrenched in this field. And John Keel, towards the end of the Mothman prophecies, was very much leaning into the paranoid side of things. So the term Phantom Stranger comes from a DC Comics character, <laughs> actually, and who is some interdimensional godlike figure. And I personally think that the term Phantom Stranger works way better for these, well, strangers who knock on your door, tell you not to talk about UFOs, and then disappear into a black Cadillac. Yeah, and sometimes they don't even have to tell you not to talk about it. They could just be strange people that seem as though they could be alien in some way. They're like uncanny. Um, John yeah. Keel, he used MIB constantly, even if it didn't refer to someone who was in a literal black suit. He would refer to yeah. these, um, you know, uniformed like Air Force type guys as also MIB, even though they were wearing like military outfits. I think one of the, the people who, the, the attempted kidnapping of Mothman witness Connie Carpenter, when people show like a representation of that attempted kidnapping, they often show like a, uh, a black suited men in black character but the actual guy described in the mothman prophecies was wearing like tie-dye so he was like more of a hippie looking guy yeah but you know so i think he was in a dark car though but either way yeah. it's just he used that word he said generically so but phantom strangers is a, is a better term and i think i've heard that elsewhere before it's a, kind of a generic way of talking about a a person that is uh, uncanny or strange like um i think mysterious stranger is another term in the yeah. in the movie lost highway i think that guy is called the mysterious stranger so it's a it's a um, it's a cliche or a trope that's found in narratives both folklore and fictional so it's a yeah. it's a good term so i think it's better but yeah whenever you study these things you come up with a bunch of terms and categories and that it's just natural that that's gonna pop up so we have a few of those in the group that i've seen like oh that's a neat term that's a, a good way of describing that as for men in black and their relation to the broader Phantom Stranger category. Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to look at the folkloric precedent of the Men in Black. During the witch trials, for example, people would confess, obviously under extreme duress, but still kind of showing the cultural beliefs that were present at the time, regardless of whether or not they themselves actually believed it, that they had met with the devil in the form of a man in black. There's even a story from, say, like, 1570s, I seem to remember. I don't have my notes in front of me right now. But um, from the 1570s of a, uh, of a woman who was accused of being a witch, and it, said, and it was said that she'd met with three men in dark clothing, which is pretty, pretty on the nose for talking about, like, Albert Bender and Grey Barker and that sort of... The, the three men, flying saucers and the three men. Yeah. 
I think Keel really expanded that mythology that Barker and Bender came up with. He expanded it until it was like what we're talking about here as a phantom stranger and found proto examples throughout prior folklore and made it uh, a very interesting category. Yeah. Absolutely. Something which I wanted to to turn the uh, to turn the tables on you <laughs> quickly, if I may. Okay. Um, so I know that you, and so you are something of an aficionado on all things on all things John Keel. Somewhat. What do you make of the recently published the uh, little pamphlet which was called The Answer from nineteen sixty from nineteen sixty seven? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. 1966 and 1967 were very big, influential, important years in Keel's life. That's when he officially got into the UFO field and was commissioned to write the article, uh, which eventually turned into Operation Trojan Horse. That's when he was spending a lot of time in Point Pleasant and, uh, you know, West Virginia, talking to Mary Heyer, talking to witnesses. And he was also doing something in Long Island with what he called a silent contactee. He had groups of silent contactees who were people that claimed contact with uh, alien beings but didn't talk about it publicly they weren't writing books about it they didn't want the limelight and one of them was a radio broadcaster jay Perro, and that's where mr apole comes from or apple or however you would want to pronounce that it's also appell he spelled it differently but it's a it's a being that is uh you know a ufo being and jay Perro claimed to talk to that being and just a bunch of shenanigans and hijinks uh ensued between the two and keel was kind of talking to the being through her and writing questions that the being would then answer in red pencil. So a lot of the questions he would ask, you know, the being would answer and he would take that as, I don't know, an answer from beyond. It, it's likely that Pero was, you know, supposedly channeling the being with the pencil or, you know, could be a hoax. Even Keel questioned yeah. the whole thing, how, like, how much of it was true, how much of it was a hoax. Yeah. So some of his ideas in 67, I think a lot of his ideas in 67, were influenced by the whole Long Island, you know, case. So think about it. He had the Long Island case going on while the Point Pleasant case was going on. And he did write about some things bled over to where like, uh, I think it was Linda Scarberry's child was named after someone who was in the Long Island case that they have no way of knowing uh, Danielle or something like that. Details from that case bled over. There was, I guess, synchronicities going on between those two cases. At the same time, he was experiencing a lot of uh, pranks from Gray Barker and over the phone and things like that. There was the whole Princess Moon Owl thing, which could have also been a, a hoax or publicity stunt. Uh, maybe that one was picked up by other hoaxers and used on him even more. So there's a lot of uh, mischief going on. So he had different ideas, but his ideas eventually evolved and solidified until we get the ideas, you know, that he later published in 1970. So 67 was a confusing year, a lot of ideas going around. He was somewhat believing in these contactees, but also doubting them, questioning, and then also peeling away at the, the layers of the phenomena because of the high strangeness in Point Pleasant. And, you know, eventually he would link monsters, spirits, UFOs together with Operation Trojan Horse. The whole answers thing, if I had to guess where he's getting those supposed answers, he's probably getting them from a poll and Jay Perro and other silent contactees and just the general saucer milieu of the, the 60s. Yeah. So he probably doesn't he probably wouldn't agree with it later in life is what I'm saying. Yeah, oh totally. That that was the question I was primarily going to ask you about these these answers he got, supposedly. So I have obviously read the Mothman prophecies, I have read um Operation Trojan Horse. But how did his beliefs change later in life? I haven't read many of his like way later works. Obviously he died in the early two in the early two thousands. What where was he by the time he entered into the twenty first century? Well, uh, of course, I can't speak for Keel. The only thing I know about him is what I've read from his books yes. and from Doug Skinner's website, johnkeel.com, which has a lot of his archives and things like that. I've also read some of his correspondence with Gray Barker and, and correspondence with Mary Heyer. I've read a, a bunch of his correspondence and picked up on some of his ideas. And his ideas were ever-changing. He was ever-evolving. He was not fixed in his thinking. But if he's writing something in a book, he's taking care to make sure that it holds up to his liking. So... The things he's written in his book are a lot more, you know, something he would stand behind than the stuff that's in his correspondence, the stuff that's in his archives that published afterwards. Like, like any Fordian, he goes back and forth between, is this stuff even real? Like, I do that constantly yeah. as well. So 
there are some times in his life where, you know, maybe he just found out something he was into was a hoax and he's more uh, cynical and he's like, this is nonsense. And then there are some times when uh, he's really getting a lot of strange phenomena and synchronicities and things are lining up and he's like, this is, this has to be the way. And so he goes around between different uh, ideas and he does cop to being a bit fanatical at some times. So like any Fordian, he's, you know, in the midst of chaos constantly. But his yes. later years, you were saying in the 21st century, where was he? Yeah. In where the... was he in terms of like his ideas of the cosmic trickster and all of these sorts of concepts? Did he still believe, for example, that the entities people would encounter through UFOs were, I think the term which he uses in Operation Trojan Horse, or at least he, he's quoting another researcher, but he uses the term like bees, that they are almost mindless drones. So does he, did he still believe that there was a, a godlike figure controlling the operations of the Earth? Hmm. Well, that, that sounds like what he was talking about in the Eighth Tower, which was more hypothetical thinking. But yeah. um, in the 80s, there was a big problem with uh, the Fordian field where the books weren't selling, uh, the paperback market yeah. crashed, a lot of the you know, UFO kind of died right there in the 80s before it came back in the 90s with uh, abductees and stuff like that. So in the 80s, he was trying to distance himself from the Fordian sphere and was trying to get back into writing fiction. Because, you know, first he started with Jadu and like men's adventure magazines and that sort of thing. So he wanted to get back to writing like fiction and he wanted to be a quote unquote serious author. Uh, he wrote some books that were like Fordian inspired that were fictional that he never got published. One of them was The Umbrella Man, which was like a uh, that famous character, he wrote a, a book that was going to be about that, or a manuscript that was going to be about that. He did an interview where he said the ultra-terrestrials, which is the name he called these beings sometimes that he borrowed from Sanderson, he said that that was a literary device, which is kind of like Charles Fort, where he was saying he doesn't believe in that, kind of like your yeah. psychic space slugs. He held to the idea that there was a quote-unquote psychic environment, and that is like the super spectrum. So he would talk about that, manifesting, materializing, so he was kind of implying that they took on physicality. They physically manifested and then demanifested. Psychic environment that surrounds us at all times. So which is like a classic occultist idea as well. You know? Oh, I, I love that idea. That sort of theory is repeated again and again and again throughout the literature of innumerable different cultures all throughout history. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And I think that through, hopefully, eventually, through science, we will start to, quantum physics specifically, through physics and that very, very almost esoteric science, if you like, we will hopefully start to understand more about what these phenomena are. And I think that, like, obviously, as a fan of Kiel, I do think that his, his ideas are important, regardless of whether whether they are literary devices or meant to be taken as actual genuine theories. I think that any, like any 14 is going to be liminal, is going to be difficult to pin down. Yeah, exactly. And I definitely think that is something, that is something which the, which great occultists have, um, have deliberately fostered for themselves, this reputation of being slippery. And yep. I think that it's promising to see that Fortians have um, have continued that legacy. That's very important for understanding Kiel. Mm -hmm. He was not going to be put into one box. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think and, especially so in the '80s because he was kind of trying to distance himself uh, so that he could focus on a, a different career. He was trying to write plays and fictional books and stuff like that because uh, he used to write for TV shows and stuff back in the day. He used to funny thing he said he, he used to write ad libs for. Uh, TV show hosts. So he, he would write the things that were supposed to be ad libs. So, but in the in the eighties, after I call it the the UFO market crash, you know, after not being able to publish his fiction and stuff like that, he went back to you know writing articles everywhere, and uh, he created the uh, New York Fortean Society. So things like that, published Disney My Other Gods. When things came back around in the nineties with like Whitley Strieber and the abductees and stuff, continued uh, republished mysterious beings, republish of strange creatures. In the 2000s, that's when the Mothman Prophecies movie came out, he was able to get uh, money from the books selling because people would buy the books after watching the movie. And uh, he used that to buy the Mothmobile, which is the his car that he got, sports car, drive around, all that good stuff. And uh, that's also when he met uh, Andrew Colvin at the Mothman Festival. He was there for the unveiling of the Mothman statue wearing his white suit. 
Andrew Colvin tried to get Keel to be like a mentor to him and would ask him questions about the phenomena. Jeff Wamsley as well, who's a local of Point Pleasant who made the Mothman Museum and the festival, he also looked to Keel as kind of like a mentor. But Keel was very tired and cynical at this, at this stage, so he, he wouldn't talk to Wamsley very much about Mothman. He would talk to him about everything else. And uh, when Andrew Colvin asked for advice, Keel would say, I've run out of bad advice to give people. But, um, you know, he still Ouch. would hit some of the notes. He would say, you know, manifestation, psychic environment. Um, Read Childhood's End is a thing he said to Andrew Colvin. So that stuck out to me because he recommends sure. that book all the way back in the 70s. And he recommends it to him in, in the 2000s. So, That's very interesting. So at the very end, if you want to know what Keel's thoughts on the phenomena uh, at the end of his life, he was essentially saying that people shouldn't spend their time studying it. So, so sorry to say, that's what he eventually came to, is that people are wasting their time and that there is no way to solve it. It's an unsolvable puzzle. And so he kind of just threw his hands up and said, you know, don't worry about it. He was uh, particularly against young people getting involved in the saucer field because he saw a bunch of teenagers, you know, wide-eyed teenagers, he called them, uh, seemingly wasting their time worrying about things that, to which there are no answers for. So that was his final, you know, his final stance is don't worry about it. It. That is, yeah, I, I did know that Keel became something of a cynic towards the close of his career. Yep. And he had uh, elders regrets, if you if you will. Yeah, that's strange. I wonder if I wonder if Will comes to that point as well. People have been trying to solve the riddles of the phenomena since you know the beginning of time. So I don't expect to solve it in my lifetime, but uh, I'm not oh, no. uh, you know not going to be worried about not finding the answer. Because um, I, yeah, I think Keel Keel was going for it. He was really like like directly trying to challenge the phenomena, directly trying to get the answers and pull the trickster from behind the curtain and unmask this phenomena. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I guess at the end, he's like, well, can't do that. And sort of uh, cynical about it. But, you know, I don't uh, have any hopes to be able to do that. So I'm just kind of content with uh, being mystified. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a really key, a key feeling to have when going into this, when going into this topic, you have to, you have to acknowledge that you're going to be stumped and that you are not going to be able to find the answers or that you are not going to be able to find the answers immediately. You are not going to be able to solve this as a one man army, basically. Mm -hmm. I've, I hope I've, uh, you know, summarized Keel's viewpoints well enough and, you know, the different evolving points in his life. But um, the ideas that people remember, the ideas that stick with people from Keel are mostly his ideas from the 70s. You know, his ideas of these things being interconnected, his fascination with high strangeness, of course, comes from Jalen Hynek, that phrase does. His uh, ideas of things that materialize and dematerialize, which is like a general UFO uh, concept that comes from elsewhere. The ultra-terrestrials was a term he coined that he uh, would give credit to, to Sanderson and the, the men in black, the, the way he used that term, which once again comes from Al Bender and <laughs> Gray Barker. So uh, a lot of the ideas come from elsewhere, but the way he wrote about them and the way he solidified them into this, I think they called it his uh, intellectual playground, that is uh, what people remember, the way he writes about these things and shows how uncanny they are and the, the, the mystifying ideas about the phenomena, which uh, he and Valet both use that phrase, the phenomenon. So the, the ideas that stick with people are his, his ideas from the 70s, especially Trojan Horse and Moth and Prophecies and Eighth Tower. Yeah, what I was saying about how we're not going to be able to solve this, like the mysteries of this phenomenon, yeah, the chances are we're not going to do it in our lifetimes. I feel like we need to kind of learn from where Kiel fell into cynicism we need to go into this field with different hopes, almost. It's only a failure if you were trying to do this specific thing in the first place. I think it's a, and... a multi-generational project. It's not something that one generation can solve. And I think Kiel definitely totally. did take us one step closer, one step forward. Oh, and, I would 100% agree with that. And if that's true, I've got to I've got to think that the phenomena allowed him to, you know, bring uh, us one step closer and show us a little bit more of its nature. And so yes. I think eventually... As time goes on, maybe more and more will take steps closer and closer and the phenomena will slowly uh, reveal itself until we, you know, can get a, a better understanding of it. And maybe one day it will step out from behind the curtain and say hello, show us yep. what it really like. But I don't, I don't think that we'll be able to uh, initiate it on our own. I think it would have to be a two-way street. I would absolutely agree with that as well. To use, like, to go fully Keelian here, looking at how long it's been playing its games for, which is thousands, if not millions of years, the chances are it's not going to step out from behind the curtain at any point in the foreseeable future, and we need to try our best to understand it and to interact with it as best we can as a culture and, and as individual people. But 
we shouldn't be expecting any grand answers. The grand answers are the answers we make for ourselves. Regardless of whether you are viewing those answers as just things which you are making up for yourself, or if you are viewing them as things which are coming to you and thus important. You know, people who collect folklore are not folklore believers, they're just people who find them to be important stories. And so as long as you yes. look at it in that way, kind of like a journalistic way that these should be documented, I think then that keeps you going, even at those times when you think there's nothing to it beyond that. Exactly. Really good message, I'd say. Okay, so we got way off track going down the questions there about the, the answers and, and Keel. So uh, other questions I had about the, the Magonia Research Group, I guess maybe I could tie in, is, is there a goal or a philosophy behind the Magonia Research Group? Is there anything specific that you guys want to accomplish or just to collaborate and, you know, document? Well, I kind of like insinuated earlier in the interview. I think that it's a twofold purpose, really. So one thing which I've noticed recently in the Magonia Research Group is just this drive to document and kind of like pile up case after case after case after case. I think this is extremely important. To create such a solid base of knowledge on this topic is extremely important, but I think that the second quote-unquote purpose of our group should also be to come up with theories and to interpret the data we are gathering. Without interpretation of data, data just becomes trading cards. Unless we are looking for trends, unless we are coming up with new wild and crazy theories, we are ultimately just collecting sportsmen. Yep. That is obviously not to denigrate the importance of collecting large numbers of cases. I think that collecting large numbers of cases is extremely important, and that data will get us to the point where we can make these sorts of wild and crazy theories. But if we don't do that, it's not. It's kind of only one, only one part of our purpose has been fulfilled, if you like. Yep. Uh, I would agree. That That's the difference between a, a folklorist and a Fordian, doing the, the documentation and the speculation. So you have to have both of those things. Recognizing trends and tropes within these stories is also very important. And uh, the great Fordians of the past did that. John Keel did that. Some of the, the current guys who are doing really great work, that's what their main focus is. Like Joshua Cutchins, his whole thing, like the Trojan Feast, is all about specifically food uh, trends and the phenomena. And his brimstone deceit is all about specifically sulfur smells and things like that that within the phenomena. So recognizing trends and tropes and sort of motifs, that's a, a very important yeah. way of analyzing the data once we acquire it. Yep, absolutely. So those are the two main goals of uh, Magonia, you would then say? I would say so, yes. Okay. I mean, obviously, you're currently only talking to just yeah. me. I think that in order to have a proper, proper rounded perspective on what the MRG is and what makes the MRG tick, you would need to talk to group, but obviously also HL. Like, HL and I, we are very much research partners, and so I think that it, it's a bit of a shame that we will ultimately probably never get to interview HL, because he is so secretive. Does he not have a microphone? Does he just not want to appear on, on voice? I don't know. I think I, he just seemingly just doesn't want to appear on voice at all. He doesn't want to... He, he wants to maintain complete anonymity. And to be honest, I can I can understand that, but just from the perspective of people who have a podcast, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a shame. <laughs> yeah. Clearly a euphonaut, right? Like that's Oh, um... <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Phantom Stranger actually. Yeah, exactly. The mysterious yeah. Mr. Humanoid Lord. Anyway. Yep. So um yes, Humanoid Lord. Lord of Humanoids. Exactly. I mean the name gives it away right there. It does, yeah. The clues in the name. Okay. So um what are your operations as being the co founder? Like what do you do in the group? I guess just moderate? Yeah, it's um moderation but also there's moderation but also representation so like going on podcasts to speak about the group and also trying to find new members and i think that's one of the things which i've recently kind of ground to a halt with that's just because of circumstances in my personal life that have kind of gotten in the way but i aim to get back on track and so people who are listening to this who knows maybe you can expect me to uh, reach out so uh how many members do you have currently in mrg uh, we currently have 57. There are some people who are more active than others, but in terms of like very, very active members, we have like approximately 20, I'd say. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively small group. It's not one of these sorts of public servers where you have people who just come in and come out endlessly. It was originally meant to be very well curated in terms of like the researchers who would be there. It, like, I, like I've been saying, I've been planning to revamp the group. So you said there's uh, about 20 super active members. Am, am I active or am I like semi-active? I try to pop in there every uh, once in a while. Yeah, so I'm, I'm counting you as I'm counting you as active. So if you know kind of how 
our active viewer that's that's me that's me kind of referring to that as our as our kind of level of activity yeah but, you know mm-hmm. and the, the other one and, um, would be ap strange who's been on here before he's he's very active in the group oh yeah yeah he's great so we have um ap strange michael who's um my co-host who's excellent hl like a uh, ren collier we have a uh, fernando who's our archivist basically mm-hmm. and uh, so he's the person who um is documenting all of these cases so he's the person who shares all of those um drawings which yep. is his which is this massive this massive compendium of cases and witness sketches and this definitely helps us kind of see see the trends which i'm talking about and formulate theories it's a yin and a yang type thing we can't do the um the theorizing we can't do the fortiana we can't do the fortiana without the folklore within the group there's like all the google docs and stuff from albert rosales of all the the big database of humanoid encounters and then there are as you said other members who have compendiums or databases as well uh, of yep. not just drawings, but also of like case files and things like that. And so really building a, a big library there as well. And um, also you guys have a bot on the, the server that takes things through the uh, the Euphonaut cipher, right? Or the uh, Crowley cipher? Yeah, Greenfield, secret cipher of the Euphonauts. There's a member who um, goes by the name of Ouroboros, who is a proper programmer and has been able to get that bot up and running. We've um, we've had some truly, some really, really interesting results. It, it's not it's not something which I personally believe reveals like ancient mystic insights. It's more something that I think helps to provide food for thought. The members of the Magonia Research Group are from a variety of perspectives. We've got uh, people who are there mainly for UFOs, and they're mainly for monsters, occultists, spiritual people of all variety. It's a Fortean thing, like true and true Fortean, meaning the whole uh, spectrum of anomalous phenomena. So I think that's a, another very good thing about Magonia, is that it's not just for UFOs or just for cryptids or whatever. It's like for all, all things Fortean. Totally. Yeah, it's totally. Yeah, it's a really well-rounded group. So we do have like proper like Thelemites and stuff. We have people who come from like even several different occult backgrounds. And we have people who provide genuinely unique takes on all these things. We have um, we have people who are very much focused on just amassing data. We have people who are focused on... Yeah, um, we, had a, we had a member, Michael Winkle, who um, is the author of a book called I Heard of That Somewhere. It, so it's a story, it, it's a book filled with... Um, filled with like the extremely strange stories that have kind of been left to left to fester at the bottom of like old newspapers basically Mm -hmm. so he was he provided us with some amazing stories from like like the early 20th century even late 19th century we have chaos magicians we have um like folklorists who focus specifically on native american folklore so we we have all sorts of insights which different members bring and uh there's a variety of uh perspectives a variety of interest there and i'm sure that the people there are there for different reasons and get different things out of it but it's a it's a pretty interesting community and i found that a lot of people there are you know jack of all trades oh totally that was one of the kind of original criteria for our um for our membership roster what what makes someone a a good candidate that you would uh, go to them and you know give them an invite and say this person would do well in our in our group? Honestly, it is that they need to come at this from a perspective which is akin to the Jacques Vallée, Jean Kiel type thing. So it is a it is it is a, a group exclusively for people who take a less nuts and bolts perspective. But beyond that, the type of person which I'm looking for right now, the four members would be people who specialize in specific areas. Such as such as the occult, such as cryptozoology. But um, in way of members, we need to have people who are open to the ideas of John Keel and John Vallée, as well as specialized in specific areas, basically. And uh, I have seen there's more of a, a trend of people who are into the the spiritual side of UFOs or monsters, and at least open to it, and not so strictly flesh and blood, nuts and bolts type. Totally, stuff. that's our kind of group focus in general. Like that that was the original the original idea. It was to bring together the people who were looking at this from a less materialistic point of view. Yeah, like the interconnected type stuff as well um with with my group i've got the appalachian mystery society the idea for that was to sort of be a uh, localized group kind of like uh those saucer clubs of, of the day uh last question here just to clear something up uh how long have you been researching and did the group start in like 2019 the group started in early 2019 i have been researching this stuff on and off all my life 
so again, like I said, when I was when I was five years old, I wanted to be a cryptozoologist. I started off just loving monsters, basically loving monsters. I loved dinosaurs as well. I, I was that sort of kid. But since then, I've kind of moved into much more the much more academic side of things, so like anthropology and that sort of thing, studying like human cultures and the kind of views people have had throughout history. Mm -hmm. And so I've been studying for my entire life. I'm 22 now. Yeah, basically that's how long I've been studying. We share the experience of having seen a, a UFO as a kid and then reconciling it and then re-realizing it because the same thing happened to me as well with uh huh. you know red lights in the sky that uh i saw wow. one christmas eve as a, as a kid that we thought might have been like a like a cell tower but it started moving back and forth and you know we left and we came back it wasn't there so Eerie. you know same same sort of thing where i i you know put that out of my mind i didn't consider it a ufo and then later when my interest in anomalies i i had to wonder like does that count and then eventually come to terms with yeah that counts that's like that's a ufo yeah. so un yes. unidentified flying object so yep. is there a, a field that specifically interests you or is it just the general 40 and stuff because i think ufos are the thing that really gets me but uh is it just all of it or is there one specific uh concept that you're into the most be it monsters spirits ufos psychic phenomena i would say whenever i'm asked that question i normally refer to the subject of passport to Magonia. so ufos and fairy law mm -hmm. and the, the intersection between the modern UFO phenomenon and ancient folklore. Okay, coolio. So we're in this off now. I think uh, the Magonia Research Group is a very interesting place with a lot of very interesting people, and it's a cool thing to see, sort of the, uh, the modern step in 4D and organizing, right? Between sure. the, oh, yeah. the, the classic flying saucer clubs, forums back in the day, and now uh, Discord, where we can talk... Uh, instant message internationally we can speak to each other as we are now over voice call and yep. uh you know get together and organize and do these things you know i think discord is it's interesting that discord is becoming a place where tons of people yeah, are setting good. up discords for uh their fan clubs and their fan groups and any kind of subject you can imagine so it's it's gone well beyond gaming and so maybe we will see the resurgence of the flying saucer club so magonia yes, research group is one that you can check out then and try to get in touch with and yeah so thank you so much for for talking to me and you know going down these different tangents and answering my questions awesome thank you yeah thank you for doing exactly the same so this has been the, the sure. ever ever mysterious ever elusive magonian I, I can get to say that i interviewed a magonian so there you go yep oh yeah the first of your kind but okay thank you so thanks for coming on and uh any, anything uh, final to say to the viewers before i close this off stay spooky Thanks for watching, and Mountaineers are always free. Say something? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, okay, so it's not the volume. So, you, so you're not actually muted, it's just not coming through for me, right? It is, it absolutely is the bloody Darrows. Wait, let me... <laughs>